China has been on the rise for some time as an economic and technological competitor of the United States, but many observers would say it lacks one crucial thing that the U.S. has in spades, namely what's known as soft power. American music and films have seduced the rest of the world and endeared the United States to people around the globe for decades. Can China develop its own soft power? Welcome to International Horizons, a podcast of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies that brings scholarly and diplomatic expertise to bear on our understanding of a wide range of international issues. My name is John Torpy, and I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. We're fortunate to have with us today Eric Schwartzel, author of Red Carpet, Hollywood, China, and the Global Battle for Cultural Supremacy, which addresses these issues from the perspective of film and the movies. Eric Schwartzel has reported on the film industry for the Wall Street Journal since 2013. He previously covered energy and the environment for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Thanks so much for joining us today, Eric Schwartzel. Hi, thank you for having me. Great to have you. Thanks so much. So, you say in the book that the that it's essentially the story of what has happened in the relationship between Hollywood and China during the interval between the original Top Gun movie with Tom Cruise and Sam Shepard and all these people uh, in 1986 and uh, the remake or the sequel, sorry, uh, Top Gun Maverick in 2017. Can you sort of tell us about what happens in that interval? Sure. I mean, the the two Top Guns are these perfect bookends because the original, when it comes out in the mid 80s, is the ultimate example of, I think, American soft power on screen. Right. It's about these amazing naval fighter pilots. Uh, Tom Cruise is the best looking fighter pilot in the world. You've got the sweep of of cinema and really, I think, an example of a moment when Hollywood was really seen as doing America's bidding, not just in its portrayal of military might, but also just in its just the cool quotient. You know, not only did enlistments after the original Top Gun came out, not only did enlistments in the military increase, but so did Ray-Ban sales. So you really had this incredibly effective marketing tool for the for the country in a movie like Top Gun. Not, and that's not just the only movie around that time. I think you could also put Dirty Dancing and Back to the Future and a bunch of hits like that in the same bucket. Um, then, whenever Paramount, which, which released the original film, decides they want to make a sequel to it, uh, many years later, around 2017 or 2018, they start marketing the film. And people notice that when Tom Cruise suits up in the new film, the jacket that he wears, which in the original film had a series of flag patches on the back of it, um, that those patches have been changed. And namely that the Taiwanese flag that had been on his back has been removed, and so has the Japanese flag. And the reason why is because of what's happened in the 30 years between those two films. And that is namely the rise of China's theatrical box office which has given the country an unbelievable economic and political leverage over Hollywood. Starting in the mid-90s, Hollywood movies started flowing into Chinese theaters, and then about 15 years later, around 2010, its box office started growing at a clip. Not only growing at a clip, but also growing as American ticket sales were flatlining. So a lot of studios, which were already becoming increasingly global, in their consumer base started looking toward China as this economic salvation. But doing work in China is not like doing work in Thailand or India or even Russia. To maintain access to those theaters and that revenue, every movie that gets released there has to be approved by Chinese censors, which means it cannot have anything in it that the censors deem politically, morally, culturally problematic. 
And that explains why the patches on Tom Cruise's jackets had, what the patches on Tom Cruise's jacket had to go because the Taiwanese flag implies a Taiwanese sovereignty that contradicts the one China policy and relations between the Chinese and the Japanese have always been somewhat charged, especially in, in more recent years. And so the Chinese financiers who were on the Top Gun movie said to the producers, you know, it might not be the worst idea in the world to put some new patches on Tom Cruise's jacket. And so suddenly you have an instance here where this movie that originally started as the ultimate commercial for America is instead now the ultimate example of how the American movie is going to be expected to placate Chinese officials. And yeah. I think the important thing to note here is that when all of this was happening a couple of years ago before the new when the new Top Gun was being marketed, Chinese officials weren't weighing in at all. No, no one from Beijing said a word. This was all done because studio executives in Los Angeles had ingested what was allowed and what was not allowed. And they knew what to self-censor before the censors could even get involved. Well, uh, you used it. I, I, I was, of course, precisely going to ask this question about censorship and self-censorship. Um, but, I mean, in a certain sense, we could put this in a broader frame, right? Um, this is really a, a, a sort of an aspect of a larger sort of mutual dependency. And sort of as I read this part of the book, uh, I remember thinking, you know, about Neil Ferguson's notion of, of Chimerica, right, that we are – I mean, the idea that we could sort of somehow separate ourselves from them I mean, has become obviously very clear once again in the course of the pandemic because they make all these, you know, uh, protective uh, devices and equipment that we, <laughs> that we needed and we didn't have them. And, you know, Trump was going to bring back a lot of that uh, manufacturing. I don't think that happened very much. But so, you know, I guess the question is, you know, how does the lever, the, the sort of element factor of, of entertainment and film, you know, help us kind of understand the larger relationship between these two countries? I mean, obviously, there's a competitive relationship. There may be a military antagonism, not so clear. I mean, we still have a hell of a lot more military equipment than they do. But you know, it's not so simple. It's not like they're these two separate entities. I mean, what you described is a relationship of, I don't know, you know, codependency or something like that. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. I think, I think the concept of Chimerica is, is, is helping me make a realization here, which is that the relationship between China and Hollywood started with China being dependent on Hollywood. It evolved into a codependency, and I think we are now in a world where Hollywood is dependent on China. Um, and, and I'll break that down. So in the mid-90s, the reason why Hollywood movies started being exported to China to begin with was because Chinese movie theaters were struggling. After the Cultural Revolution, movie theaters reopened and primarily were showing Chinese propaganda films and very dry medicinal documentaries. As China's economy modernized and in the years ahead of its acceptance into the WTO, the Chinese movie theaters were struggling so much because even despite, despite the Chinese propaganda being the only show in town, it was soon starting to see comp competition from pirated movies that were frankly more entertaining to watch karaoke salons and, and television were starting to really eat away. And the Chinese theatrical market, small though it was, really needed an economic boost. And so movies started coming into China like The Fugitive, True Lies, these big Hollywood spectacles that Chinese audiences had largely been shut off to for the past 30 or 40 years since Mao took power. Um, and that really did provide this excellent economic boost to the to the theaters by 1998 I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me but a handful of movies caused something like a 45 percent jump in the Chinese box office still we're talking like re, like pocket change to the studios but for Chinese theater owners a massive stimulus program here then as China's box office grows there is a codependency because Chinese theaters still need the economic movies to goose 
their overall revenue, Hollywood starts to need the Chinese grosses to plug holes like the the collapse of the DVD market that leaves a lot of studios struggling and um other other aspects like I'd mentioned like the like the stagnant ticket sales here in in the US. So there's kind of a codependency there. And now we're in a world where China has really learned and studied how America built its entertainment industry to the point that um, the China's film industry is much more commercial. Its audiences are more and more preferring Chinese uh, Chinese movies to American movies. And this Hollywood system that over the past decade has built up a real dependence on those grosses is seeing less and less certainty there in the form of Chinese tastes evolving away from American films and also um, Chinese authorities letting fewer and fewer American movies in. So, so the Chimerica model is, was definitely the case for much of this relationship. I think it's looking less and less so now. And it's really putting the Hollywood studios in something of a bind because they have threaded themselves so deeply into, into China. And every time, still today, I think when a massive Marvel movie or a massive Fast and Furious movie is put into production at something like $250 million, that studio is counting on a Chinese release. And and that Chinese release is less and less certain. I see. So, I mean, you know, one question I had is precisely, I mean, has China begun to develop its own, you know, soft power, at least in this uh, area? And, uh, I mean, it sounds like you're saying they have, and uh, increasingly they're amusing their own people. They're not relying on outsourcing it to, to Hollywood, which I assume if you ever said that to a Hollywood studio executive, they would sort of recoil. I mean, they might sort of admit that it's the case, but I would imagine they would not be happy about the idea that you're saying that, you know, Hollywood studios are dependent on uh, the preferences of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I mean, that would not be good for business, I would think, in the United States. And yet it's something they're at least were sort of dependent on, sounds like. Very much dependent on it. And, and, but I don't necessarily know if the, the success of China's film industry and the commercialization of it has led to soft power. That is the, that is the final leg of the race that is still being, still being run. And so I think certainly internally, China's film industry has, has been an incredible boon for Xi Jinping because Chinese filmmakers have learned often from Hollywood how to make, let's call it good propaganda. I think Chinese propaganda films before the, before let's say 2000 or so were often incredibly dry, boring, um, educational films. And Chinese officials literally studied American movies like The Patriot, the um, the Mel Gibson movie about the Revolutionary War, to see how to make a propaganda movie that doesn't feel like propaganda. I think there's a there's a real distinction to be made here. I mean, I think oftentimes critics will will call American movies propaganda. I I I, I see their point, and I see the the propagandistic element of certain American movies. I do think we're talking about a different level whenever authorities in China are putting movies into production, approving scripts, casting actors. I mean, that that is more of a state effort than something like a movie like The Patriot is, where it's like a pro-U.S. narrative. Mm-hmm. Or, or like a, let's say, like a historically revisionist take on, on American uh, history. So, but, but anyway, so all which is to say, there have been examples now of Chinese movies, like the, the one that is, is best known in diplomatic circles is this film Wolf, Wolf Warrior 2, which was this massive Chinese blockbuster that was essentially a version of China's Rambo. It was about a Chinese soldier who has to go to Africa 
and save the villagers, win the girl. It's it's like a classic. Um, it's like watching Rambo, but um, with a Chinese guy instead of a an American guy. Um, and the Americans look like the buffoons rather than than the heroes. Uh, this movie was a massive success, and it it really showed how effective popcorn entertainment or propaganda disguised as popcorn entertainment can be. Now, but the big issue, the big problem is that Wolf Warrior 2 made something like $850 million, a massive amount of money, but 99% of that gross was in China alone. It was not as popular overseas. And so I think soft power, as we've traditionally defined it, is a um, an export. You know, there might be there might be some internal uh, benefits to it, but it's primarily been seen as this um, kind of uh, colonizing or or outside outside force, and and China is still struggling there. I think there are places where if you look, there's significant inroads being made, primarily in places like Africa and through um, things like the Belt and Road Initiative the massive collection of trade deals, what, what else is there? Infrastructure, loans, everything that, 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 China, that has given China this, this foothold in major, parts of the, in, in major parts of the world, largely out of sight to most Americans, I think. You know, that is functioning as something of a soft power distribution network. And, and I learned that whenever I went to Africa and, and did some reporting on an initiative called the 10,000 Villages Project, which is this pretty remarkable initiative to hand out low-cost ch- Chinese satellite dishes to African villages where, that carry Chinese movies and TV shows on them. And so I was in Kenya talking to Kenyans who love Chinese movies and meeting, you know, young children who idealize the Monkey King. Um, and so there, it's working. It's working in some parts of the world. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know how effective it would be in, in the West. I think there's probably still, there's probably still a steeper hill there to climb. Yeah. So this is interesting though, that, um, you know, we have this image or one reads things to the effect that, you know, what China's really doing is kind of imposing a sort of, you know, debt servitude on African countries by loaning them all this money that they can never actually pay back or, you know, building roads and bridges and things that the Africans can't afford and then they're in the debt of the Chinese. But it does sound like it, you know, in a certain sense may literally be softened by, you know, culture, by entertainment. And, uh, I mean, I get that, you know, this may not do it for different, you know, populations in Europe, Western Europe and, and the United States or Canada or whatever. Uh, but it does sound like it may be, as you say, it may well be working at least in those places where China has a presence, which itself is, let's remember, you know, historically unprecedented. I mean, they've never really sought to kind of, I mean, it may or may not be settler colonialism, but they've never really reached outside of the Middle Kingdom in the way that they're doing today. So... Right. There's there's and there's quite a debate in places like Kenya, which is, you know, rather recently coming out of settler colonialism about whether or not this form this is a form of some kind of neo colonialism. And so there are real concerns there. I think there are also a lot of uh political leaders and civilians who think that China's pragmatic form of aid is what they need more than and the sort of the American school, right? Like we're literally building roads, literally building uh, train stations and, and so on. And, and also I think for, from a political standpoint, staying out of internal affairs and staying out of, um, you know, not raising issues about religious well, corruption, reading or, corruption and, and, yeah. and things like that. Of course, of course. Yeah. So, so that is, that is, that is certainly true. And, and what you said about, the culture needing to soften their arrival is is a smart one because it it I was in some villages far outside Nairobi where I was the only light skinned person 
outside of a Chinese person who these people had ever seen visit. And and so there was I mean, imagine that. Think about how weird that must have been to have dozens of Chinese people show up seemingly out of nowhere. There had to be some kind of cultural introduction to to the country, which I which I think these satellite dishes allowed. And then the other thing that you were you hit on was that there did need to be some winning over. I mean, in in this this village I had spent most of my time in Suswa. I mean, the they had built the Chinese had built a train station um, that is going to connect Inner Kenya to Mombasa in the co on the coast, and the construction was wildly disruptive. It um, like a couple elephants died during it. Um, some lions escaped their um, constrained area because of the construction dust that was generated from it had dried out crops like there was some real resentment over this this construction that that you're right they they needed to win the people back over and um you know i think a lot of the a lot of the folks i talked to they, they allow a kind of coexistence um between chinese Kenyan and American entertainment, but there's there's no real bias against Chinese entertainment that I that I think you would you would see in Western Europe or the U.S. Interesting. So, I mean, I I guess I've sort of in anticipation of this conversation, I sort of tried to think about you know why is it that some countries are seem to be better at you know, if you like it, soft power than others. I mean, China has, I think any unbiased observer would agree, an enormously rich, you know, historical culture and music and literature and, you know, all these things. It's not like they don't have these things, but they don't necessarily, you know, carry outside of their own sort of cultural sphere. And the United States, I suppose, in particular, I mean, I just was watching this you know, Beatles movie the other day and thinking about these issues. You know, that kind of stuff has been very popular around the world. People learned English that way during the, you know, during the Cold War. Um, and, you know, I think it's generally thought to have had these kind of, uh, you know, implications of, you know, freedom and self-expression and things that weren't necessarily all that congenial to authoritarian rulers. Um, but, that, but that doesn't, you know, necessarily indicate or explain why there's this uptake. So I wonder if you've thought at all about, you know, why there, what, what sorts of limitations kind of there may be on certain cultures in the way that they are or are not, you know, absorbed uh, in other places. And what explains that? Well, I think um, yeah, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. And I think that one thing I learned when I was researching the history um, of Hollywood for this book was just how much luck played into Hollywood becoming this global medium. Um, when the movie was invented in the early or I'd say what would be late 19th century, early 20th century, Europe was really where the the better movies were being made and the more sophisticated filmmaking cultures were um, in places like Italy and France. And then when World War I broke out and production stopped on the European continent because fighting would, had broken out on the continent, it gave America this chance to catch up um, that... I mean, no one could have could have anticipated. So they caught up in sophistication. And then the other the other point is that the French and the Italians largely saw the cinema as a, another place to reflect their culture, whereas America, probably because it was a younger country and maybe more of a maybe less of a homogenous country, saw it as a place to forge a culture. And and so there there was something of a there's a there's a theory that it was sort of just more of a unique fingerprint that made it more exportable around the world. Well, and so if I if I can interject just for a second though, I mean one of the things you said about uh, what made Italian or European French film, you know, uh, the leading edge originally was its sophistication. 
and I would say it's perhaps precisely the idea that, you know, you might say in Tocquevillian terms, you know, non-aristocratic cultures are not concerned so much about sophistication. They're concerned about selling stuff. And Tom Cruise is a good looking guy and I mean he's only five six or whatever it is, but you never know that. And you know, because they figured out how to mask that fact. Because he's this good looking guy and people go to see good looking people. It's not about the sophistication, you know. Yeah, so. you're right. I like that I like that because um yeah, because when uh when the American film gained an edge over the French or the Italian film, there were all these stories in the European press about how the, the American film was so de classe and, and re, you're exactly right. And it was so de classe compared to their traditions of opera and, and the theater. And, and it's interesting too, because it was another example of America occupying a role that China would a hundred years later, where down to the point that America was seen as a place for kind of black market goods and you know knockoffs it was just it felt like it seemed like it was a real knockoff culture in i mean much the same way that like i mean what do a lot of people think about china they think it's a place where you can go get fake purses and and things like that so you're right i think that's i think that's a great point and there was absolutely from its earliest days a sense of of salesmanship and and actually there was it's funny i got a little obsessed with with that whole idea whenever i was working on this book because I think when you move to Los Angeles, you you quickly see just that this is a this is a real workaday business, and and you're right, everyone is five six, and 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 I even I even there's a there's a point in the book where I had to I was interviewing some some folks who worked in what they called hidden effects, which are the the special effects that aren't the car explosions or the big mutants or whatever. They are the people who go in and, and smooth out splotchy makeup or, you know, edit out an underwear line so that a woman appears fully nude, you know. And I thought, wow, these are actually the people who make the movies. This is this is what the movies actually uh, need to to work as as entertainment are those are those little those touches. But but anyway, back to your back to your question about what makes a country better at soft power. I think I think you're right about sort of the American approach being just more inherently appealing and more just kind of egalitarian or democratic and and big tent. It was more of a big tent approach, right? Than than the Europeans might have taken. The other the other case study that's bearing out right now that's been interesting to watch is Korea, which has has had success with things like Squid Game and Parasite and K-pop, um, Korea really is functioning on a level that I think the Chinese leadership would really love to see their own country do. A big distinction would be the fact that Chinese authorities would never allow the production of a Squid Game or a Parasite. And and one of the thing one of the reasons both of those programs have appealed so widely and cut through is just how provocative they are and there's a there's a level of not just violence but just, there's just a there's a class commentary in in both of those in that movie and in that tv show that would never fly in china so i think if we're going to look for something like what would china's version of squid game be what would china's global tv phenomenon look like it would be something much more family friendly let's say Right. So, I mean, I don't want to, you know, take credit. For the, I don't want the United States to take credit for it exactly. But I wonder whether the American, you know, footprint or, or influence in in Korea, would you say it has anything to do with the success of K-pop and Parasite? I mean, Parasite, I haven't seen it, but, you know, I gather is a sort of sharply anti-capitalist sort of movie. But, mm -hmm. but whatever, I mean, that's it's not so much about the message. It's the question of, you know, how appealing this is. And, of course, it won an Academy Award, I, b I believe, right? You did. It won Best Picture. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. what a fascinating, what a fascinating question. I don't know. I don't know enough about how the Korean cinema evolved. I because I can remember in the in the early two thousands there were there were Korean exports that were very popular, and then there was a moment when Hollywood started looking toward Korean horror films to adapt 
into America. I mean, the, I remember The Ring was a, a Korean story that was adapted for American audiences. So there started to be this kind of exchange even back then. Uh, what a great, what a great point though about America's presence there. I mean, certainly, you know, it's interesting. What I, I think, I think, um, I agree. Like, yeah, we don't want to say, well, yeah, they're only good because they, because of America, but I, there is certainly something to be said for exposure like that. Like, I, I interviewed for the book uh, Ang Lee, who um, I think is now in his 60s, but so was growing up at a time when a lot of his contemporaries in mainland China were growing up in a cultural revolution that didn't allow for much art of any kind that wasn't strictly Maoist and and filled with messaging. Propagandistic, yeah. Um, He, however, grew up in Taiwan where he would go to the cinema with his mom and see Billy Wilder films and see all sorts of, all sorts of movies like that. So uh, I think that, yeah, there's something, there's something to be said for exposure and exchange that can, that can do quite a bit like that. I mean, similarly in mainland China, after, after the cultural revolution, there was this group of Chinese filmmakers that came to be known as the fifth generation and these are people like uh, Zhang Yimo and Chen Kaiga, who in the 90s were these art house sensations making movies like Farewell My Concubine, Raise the Red Lantern, these movies that were just absolutely adored by art house audiences around the world. They have, a, they, they all share something in common, which is that they all started attending the Beijing Film Academy in the year or two after the Cultural Revolution. And when they started going to the Beijing Film Academy, there was actually there was a literal break. And while they were there, they started to be allowed to watch American movies like The Deer Hunter and Casablanca, movies that had traditionally been shut off. And and so I don't think it's a coincidence there either that they became these art house phenoms. You know, they made movies that got them banned in China, but around the world. Their movies were, um, you know, absolutely rapturously received. Right, fascinating. So, I guess just one last question. I mean, you know, what do you think are the chances of China developing, you know, a, a sophistication in in soft power that will give it, you know, traction outside of the places that you know you've discussed already, places that it's, you know, providing infrastructure and and loans and that kind of thing to, um, you know. Uh, should we, should we be worried? I mean, not that I'm exactly worried, but mm. uh, you know, what are the chances of that happening? I, mean, I, I do sort of think there, as I say, kind of intrinsic uh, difficulties that uh, what I would call following Tocqueville that aristocratic societies have with sort of the idea of reaching a broad audience and 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 you know, sort of letting go of certain kinds of sophistication. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because in China, it's um, there's just an incredible concern with aesthetic and image, and 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 sort of p- always putting a best face forward. So it can have a, and th- and this goes back to I, I spoke to um, a young woman, or no, well, she was a young woman when she moved to China in the in the seventies, who would tell me these stories about how. Um, she was in Beijing and it was just a, it was a pretty gray and dismal place. But anytime there was a military parade, all of the trash would disappear off the street. And that is, it is kind of a philosophy that extends to their cinema. Every, every movie is going to portray a developed, lawful, clean China, which can have a kind of flattening effect, right? It can, it can, it can be hard to, hard to hook you in if, if everything is it looks so varnished and and perfect um and so it's in, so it's it's interesting like i would say if i had to predict what could be like a squid game what could what could take off like that it would probably be something like a, maybe like a chinese soap opera which um just because the the soap opera as a, as a genre has fewer the problems that you're the, the the Tocquevillian problems that you're describing, right? It's like it's meant to be pulpy, it's meant to be um, 
you know, uh, a little campy. And so, and, and I know the Chinese soap operas are massively popular in China. I mean, like you, you can't imagine how many soap operas are made and how many people watch these, these shows. And, and I know that they were popular among a lot of people I talked to in Kenya. Um, that, that is a possibility now, but, but the bigger question would be, like, does that do anything to change shifting American opinions on the country itself? And, and it, I think it could have some effect there, but it, it feels like we are, we're really, I've just even noticed in the, in the, in the two weeks I've been promoting this book, I've noticed a shift in the conversation that a conversation that used to be, I think, primarily the domain of people on the right is now becoming more of a bipartisan issue. And I think a lot of a lot of Americans feel very queasy when they hear about Western companies placating Chinese officials. And it, it feels like we're 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 reaching a moment where I don't know if pre-existing attitudes toward China would cut off any possibility of Chinese entertainment catching on. And there, and you're seeing this in certain diplomatic circles too. There was there was this moment especially during the Trump administration where Chinese officials met aggression with aggression and and they practiced what they called wolf warrior diplomacy which is like never never bowing, never um apologizing for China just going aggressively after any critic large or small. And there's a sense in some parts of the CCP, I'm told, that that has lost more friends than it's gained and that they need to take a softer approach. Um, and I think that that would be required, I think, before any kind of Chinese entertainment might break through in the West. But I guess if you're probably if you're in Beijing, they, they might say, well, yeah, but who cares about the West? <laughs> right. We've got other fish to fry. Mm hmm. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this has been a great conversation. You heard it here first. Keep your eye out for Chinese soap operas on cable TV channel. Uh, I want to thank Eric Schwartzel for discussing his fascinating new book, Red Carpet, and for sharing his insights about China's use of the movies to expand its soft power. Remember to subscribe and rate International Horizons on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. I want to thank Osvaldo Mena Aguilar for his technical assistance, as well as to acknowledge Duncan McKay for sharing his song, International Horizons, as the theme music for the show. This is John Torpy saying thanks for joining us, and we look forward to having you with us for the next episode of International Horizons. <laughs>